going to bring up, before we open up to questions with, uh, with, the, with the presenters here, we're going to bring up four other experts that we would like to join that are practitioners in this space. Joe and Joe and Stephen and Glenn. The challenge will be seats. Maybe we can work this one out also. While, while we do that shuffle, I wanted to just thank um, Jonathan um, very much for hosting us here at the Oldest Zoo and, and your call for ambition, which is something that, uh, that we live by in Forest Trends. Peter, for your, uh, the leadership of, of the UK in many of these issues and, and sustained courage to you as you continue to show that leadership. Julia, for your long-standing uh, friendship and, and partnership at IUCN, such an important institution. Um, Braulio, for keeping biodiversity kind of in the, in, in the game. Um, you know, there are, there are many games underway, the climate change negotiations, all those things. We need to make sure biodiversity does not lose itself in all of those other large waves. And, and Peter, for your call, I, I love also the, the idea of natural capital, which is how we describe um, these things, um, and the idea of a systemic approach and, and the incredibly important role you play in making sure that business has this in the middle of what they're thinking as they go forward. At Forest Trends, we always like to talk about what we're up against here is trying to make the priceless valuable. That's, that's our challenge for all of us. So let me um, introduce some of my co the new colleagues that have arrived, and, and let's start from the far end there, Glenn uh, Davies, who uh, is currently the Executive Director of Global Programs at WWF UK, and um, was here at the, at the zoo uh, as the Director for Conservation Programs for a number of years, collaborated with us here, has also been with the European Commission. And what I'm going to do is ask a question of you, and then I'll, I'll introduce the other colleagues uh, one at a time. But, Peter, but Glenn, there was um, um, a lot of discussion about Virunga already in this opening panel. And you guys took out a, a World Heritage Site, and you guys took out an advertisement in the program, which, which is the title is something like Virunga, the world's most beautiful oil facility, or something like that. And, I, and I'd like you to reflect a little bit on on the, the, um, the drive that WWF has underway right now to keep Virunga as a, as a no-go zone. And how does that work in, in, this, in this setting? How does it work for the government, which is going to have to say no to, I don't know, hundreds of millions of dollars of revenues, maybe more, and, and to the business that's involved in it right now that obviously uh, has a lot to gain also. So Glenn? Thank you. Am I? Yeah, thank you. So thank you, Michael. Thank you uh, for organizing, Kerry, Jonathan. Um, WWF is committed to a world where people and nature thrive, and we've heard a lot about the links we need to make uh, between development, uh, between societal needs, between maintaining a biodiverse uh, planet. And one of the fundamental first steps is where are the no-go areas for development? Uh, where are the lines in the sand that we need to draw? And as two speakers have said, uh, World Heritage Sites have been identified for their multiple importance in culture. Uh, and so WDF has gone out uh, on a limb to say, uh, in the Virunga case, uh, largest national park, oldest national park in Africa, uh, it's a World Heritage Site. Uh, it should be held and protected for posterity uh, for many different reasons biodiversity, but also cultural and historical. There are other sites. I mean, I think the Natura 2000 sites in Europe are very important no-go areas. And we need to start there rather than starting at how can we have a biodiversity offset. And I know there's no suggestion of that from the technical, but the uh, political and emotional uh, feeling is that if we start at biodiversity offsets, we may, we'll probably get a bad outcome. I agree. We're not trying to start that. We're to, where's the no-go? We know, though, that protected areas are not sufficient to have a biodiversity-rich world. We need connectivity. We need to be able to adapt to climate change and so forth. So how do we engage outside of those no-go zones, which is the bulk of the world? Um, WWF is committed to standards uh, and to engaging with business to try and establish those standards. The Forest Stewardship Council, the Marine Stewardship Council are examples of 
how do we try and set a standard that will give us an outcome <laughs> that maintains natural resources but allows development? And I see the biodiversity offsets in that same space uh, outside of the no-go zones. <laughs> There's a lot of work to do, and we've heard you know, indications of the uncertainty, uh, the lack of standards, the lack of clear guidelines that everyone can adhere to. So that's what part of this conference is about, and a lot of work that's gone on before it. Um, I'd like to stress net gain. I think that if in the context of biodiversity offsets, we go for no net loss, we will be on a declining graph or a st more steeply declining graph than we are at the minute. Uh, the cumulative impacts of development, which will not be subject to biodiversity offsets, the impacts of climate change, the many other impacts. I, you know, just, I'd like to wave a flag for net gain. And, and uh, yeah, let's not kill people, I agree. But <laughs> what's the positive thing we're going to achieve? And the process is, um, Yes, science is really important to guide our decision-making, but it's going to have to include economic science and social science as well as the biological science. Those uh, political decisions that are going to be made, uh, in the case of DRC, uh, it will be informed by multiple aspects, not just the biological. And again, we're committed to that in terms of principles and criteria that WWF tries to work on for a biodiverse uh, world where people and nature thrive. So I think... That's where we're from. I just wanted to try and set a context that we don't go into the weeds on the offsetting only, but what's the bigger picture and that uh, offsetting is the bottom of a hierarchy. Uh, no go, avoid, minimize, restore, and then potentially offset at the end of that. And uh, I think that fits in with many of the things that were said. Yeah, great. Thank you, Glenn. Um, just moving along quickly, I'm going to ask uh, another colleague, Joe Kiesecker from uh, the Nature Conservancy to say a few things. He's the lead scientist there at the Nature Conservancy, was also part of the pioneering group that created Development by Design, a, an important initiative out of the Nature Conservancy. And you guys have worked around the world. Uh, you work in the United States in places like Wyoming. You worked in Mongolia with these challenges. I think there are two questions that I'd like you to address briefly. One is, um, you know, we've talked about the, the mitigation hierarchy and you've got these steps before you do offsets. And, and tell me how you kind of measure those steps, the idea of avoiding and minimizing. When you're working with businesses in Wyoming, how do we know that they're taking all of the, the steps they need to make sure that they're doing those initial steps well? And, and the second one is, I think this is what, uh, what Peter was emphasizing with, with the world of businesses, scale. We're all in this world, we're saying scale, scale, scale. We can't do projects anymore, we need to work at landscapes. But how do you, you know, landscapes for, lands for landscapes to function, for businesses to be able to work in landscapes, you need the government to play that role of creating that frame. And are they stepping up to the plate, whether it's in Wyoming, the United States, or Mongolia? Um. I guess to start out, I'd like to, well, first say thanks for having me. It's, it looks like it's going to be an exciting conference. Look forward to the next couple of days. Um, but build a little bit of the foundation to, I think, make it clear why we're emphasizing the promotion of mitigation through a landscape perspective. I think the big question, I think Carrie said it well, is we don't have a lot of uh, empirical data information on whether we're achieving no net loss. There's, just, there's not a lot of case experience um, on the application of mitigation hierarchy. Uh, some great tools, thanks to groups like Bebop, that, that I think can promote the implementation of mitigation hierarchy to achieve no net loss or net positive outcome. But one exception to that, I think, is, um, is wetlands mitigation in the U.S. We've got about 40 years of experience. Uh, we spend roughly $3.5 billion every year on wetlands mitigation. Uh, over the last decade plus, we started to look at the commitment to known at loss and assess whether wetlands mitigation has achieved that goal or not. And the, the overwhelming answer to that question is no. Uh, in terms of biodiversity value, in terms of functional value of wetlands, we're not hitting that known at loss outcome. And, and the studies point to an over-reliance on offsets and a lack of a, destruction, a structured decision-making framework for how to apply the mitigation hierarchy, how to, how to identify situations where uh, 
a development isn't appropriate and should be avoided. When we do use offsets, they're implemented on a very piecemeal site-by-site -site basis. And, and so we're at an improper ecological scale. We're also reactive when we, th we don't think about mitigation until someone proposes a development. And so all those recommendations have led to a, a, a fairly dramatic shift um, in the United States, starting first with a shift to thinking about wetlands mitigation uh, at a watershed or landscape scale in 2009, and more recently, uh, presidential decree and then secretarial order from the Department of Interior, which manages about a quarter to a fifth of the United States, to think about mitigation at a landscape scale. So, to, and to do that not only uh, reactively but proactively, to, to try to bring landscape level conservation objectives to the table with development planning. Project future development, project look at different development scenarios. How can we meet our development objectives in, in, in a variety of different ways? How can we meet our conservation objectives? How can we optimize those two, those two things? Bringing those to the table, blending them with what is a, with a fairly rigorous science of systematic conservation planning and bringing that to the table as the sort of the, the, the structured decision-making framework that can then guide not only the use of offsets, but the entirety of the mitigation hierarchy. Now, it, it's, you know, 2009, very much in its early stages in terms of wetland mitigation and implementation. But there's some early uh, places to point to, I think, that, that show some outcomes that are, that are pretty positive. I'll, I had a handful of examples. I'll just, I'll draw on two. Um, in North Carolina, the state's ecosystem enhancement program has really pushed the Department of Transportation there, um, which deals with a lot of the wetlands mitigation to take a landscape level approach. Um, and one of the outcomes of that is one, I'll, I'll leave the, po the positive conservation outcomes, but the a significant cost savings in the implementation of mitigation, um, roughly about 32 to $65 million a year in terms of what it cost prior to thinking about landscape level mitigation and implementation of, of wetlands offsets and, and the mitigation hierarchy. Similar kind of uh, outcome in Michigan where the Department of Transportation, again, looking at compensation for wetlands mitigation, prior to thinking and moving to a broader landscape scale, was spending roughly about $100,000 per acre for wetlands mitigation. That sort of consolidation of <coughs> mitigation and the, the structured decision-making framework really reduced those costs about twenty five dollars to $30,000 per acre. I'll attribute a lot of that to the economies of scale, thinking at planning ahead proactively, adding, looking at where development's likely to go, where mitigation needs are going to be, and then designing offsets that can be in place proactively. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, so I'm going to turn now to uh, Stephen Dickinson, uh, who uh, has also been a long-term collaborator for a number of years um, and has been working in places like Madagascar and uh, some of the uh, islands in Indonesia, and is currently the Corporate Biodiversity Advisor for Total. And um, you've, you've worked a lot now with um, some of the uh, performance indicators that financial institutions are using. And uh, in, you know another critical partner in, in, in this coalition that needs to be built are to make sure that the financial institutions have the right instruments in place and that they're really um, following up on, on and understanding what's needed to do on the ground. So maybe you could reflect a little bit on, on your interactions with some of the financial institutions that are at the table also. Right. So um, I guess it's important to point out that I'm kind of speaking on my own behalf here and based on my own experience. So the, the projects uh, I was lucky enough to be involved in, um, I'd say we're pretty much on the extreme end of the spectrum for uh, biodiversity sensitive sensitivity and management. Um, there are also projects uh, that you hear more about of today. And um, now, of course, these projects had their own specific biodiversity policies with clear outcomes uh, linked to no net loss and net gain. And there was a very strong um, <coughs> factor uh, linked to, to the financing of these projects. So the considerations for uh, 
um, bringing in uh, that, that, that very high level of effort aligned with the financial institution's expectations was definitely a, a, a key driver. And that, um, that remained during the period of time I was involved on these projects and I, I believe continues today. So I think uh, the, but it, the, the, the driving uh, aspects of the financial institutions to, to secure the, the, um, the monies essentially for, for the projects, um, you know, brought on very high, uh, high levels of standards and expectations for, uh, for the projects and, and set the bar very high. Now, this reflected, this well, essentially was um, uh, instigated right at the beginning of the projects um, through a very detailed uh, studies and uh, also very uh, demanding um, impact management uh, plans. Um, and of course, the transparency was critical there too, um, in the sense that the visibility had to be secured uh, to ensure that the financial institutions uh, were comfortable um, with um, the, the standards being met. So all this has to be built in um, from, from the beginning and has to be secured during the lifetime of the project. Um, and I think is, is a way of, uh, uh, of, or a healthy way of driving the processes for uh, managing biodiversity uh, on, these, on these very large projects. Yeah. Great, thank you, Stephen. And, and finally, I'm gonna ask Joe to, uh, Joe Tariq, who was with the e-accountability and also a long time collaborator on, on many of these issues and has worked around the world with governments, with businesses, uh, with financial institutions to tell us a little bit about how, do, how does this hierarchy work? How does the mitigation hierarchy work in practice? And how does it work for people and the local communities that are many times in the middle of this activity? Yeah, okay, so I'm a jobbing consultant and my concern really is to try and find leverage to get things to be done right and that I look at it quite simply like that. Um, I had the opportunity many, many years ago to do a very comprehensive review of environmental statements and to look at the extent to which they addressed biodiversity impacts and how they mitigated those impacts. And that changed the direction of the rest of my career because it became very evident that you can't even assume, or couldn't then certainly, that the mitigation that would be recommended in environmental impact statements would even match the impacts that had been identified. So therefore one might plant 50 trees when the impact was on a, an endangered aquatic beetle. You know, so the, the mismatches were absolutely enormous. So um, you know, there was a lot to be done to improve practice that has absolutely nothing to do with um, high aspirational standards or whether you offset or not at the end of the day. So my perspective on this has come around to the fact that the, the business as usual scenario is that impacts are not appropriately mitigated and that there are residual impacts that are often incredibly significant. And I see offsets, for example, as just a logical adjunct to a good mitigation strategy that any business would use for any project or that you would have in place at government level for a landscape. It does not make any sense at all not to include offsets if you've done damage through other means that you don't intend to fix in any other way. So I see offsets as just a normal and sensible addition to that mix. Obviously, if used appropriately. I see risks with this idea that they're the last resort, and I see that risk because what tends to happen then is that nobody discusses them or feels they can't discuss them until the very latest stages of project design when it's actually too late to do it properly. The reason a lot of offsets fail is because they're planned too late and that's true of all biodiversity concerns that are built into the development design process. So having offsets in mind at the beginning, in my experience, has actually improved the extent to which the mitigation hierarchy is implemented. 
and there have been two big game changes in that in my life as a consultant. The first was the Habitats Directive in the EU, which actually set a goal of um, maintaining the integrity of sites and the status of species and required people to actually do something about that through compensation. And the second has been the performance standards, which set clear circumstances in which you're required to achieve no net loss or net gain so that business knows what it's trying to achieve, um, ecologists know what they're looking for, and we can work together to identify some sort of solution to that problem. So for me, in my practical experience, those have been two game-changing events. And I think <coughs> we're at an early stage in some of this bedding in, but I think there are positive signs that some of it can work, if there's a good standard. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. So we're now going to open it up finally. And this is a big panel, but we wanted to make sure we had all these perspectives out there to start with. And I wanted to urge you to, first question should go to Peter from DEFRA, who's going to have to leave us at 1030. And I'm sure there are some burning questions for Peter. So um, we open it up to the audience for any questions. We're not going to have coffee until we have some questions. <laughs> Sorry about that. Julia. Can I ask, uh, I'd like to ask Peter a question, if I may. Well, how do you see the discussion among governments, among your, your colleagues and other environment ministries and so on about these issues? And, and, and what is the, the pressure put on the so-called developed world that we're supposedly in in, in Europe? from the so-called developing world. I can't stand those differences, but they, they exist in some ways. Yeah. I think there's, there's lots of different pressures on governments sort of developed and uh, developing. Within, within the, uh, the UK, certainly, we've had our consultation on offsets recently, and a lot of what's been said today has come through very clearly, that uh, I, I don't think I've ever seen a subject that has so much suspicion on either side of the debate. Uh, you know, as being said, the sort of developers concerned, here's another tax coming along on development and some NGOs concerned here is a license to trash. Um, so the, the, the feeling is we need to find, uh, you know, you know is, is there a way through that that, um, uh, that meets those two concerns? Um, I think within Europe generally on the, the Habitats Directive, which has been mentioned as a, a real game changer here, there are you know, increasingly countries looking at it as, as we move forward and as the suite of sites becomes uh, more mature, and in, in all countries in Europe, we have now cases where development is coming up against us and testing the boundaries of the Habitats Directive. I think there'll be interesting debates as we go forward on that. Crucial to this, I think, uh, I, I thought the speech that Peter Backer gave hit the nail on the head, really, is engaging business and um, getting uh, <coughs> um, business to take the, the same as has happened in the climate debate, where I think business have been a big move forward. And of course, there I tease my colleagues who deal with climate and deck because it's very easy to trade carbon and, and talk about offsetting carbon where uh, you know, a ton of carbon in Beijing is the same as a ton of carbon in uh, uh, Barnsley. Uh, here, from what we just heard this morning, things are so complex, uh, you know, if we're going to have offsetting, uh, where do we stop? Do we have separate offsets for each species, separate offsets for each habitat? Uh, if you go too far down that road, it becomes unworkable. Uh, on the other hand, I think we'd all agree, you know, you certainly can't trade some aspects of biodiversity for the others. So it's a much more complex issue, but I think encouragingly some of the businesses we've got here are coming forward and getting engaged in a way that they have been on climate, and that I think will be one of the things that drives this forward. Peter, did you have a question or response? No, no, it was the audience. Oh, great. They go there first. Go. Otherwise, I'll talk. Could you introduce yourself also? Uh, just, uh, just one moment. Um, let me turn this on. Don't do what I'm doing now. Please use the microphone so the live streaming people will be able to hear you. And this is not a live mic. <laughs> Don't use yours. Okay. Um, maybe there we go. If it's just yes, repeated, it's on now. Um, Try. <laughs> uh, good morning, I'm George Ledeck, a lead ecologist in the Africa region of the World <coughs> Bank. And I want to uh, ask a question of Peter of the World Business Council on Sustainable Development. 
I agree with your point that talking about this as no net loss is kind of a defensive position and it's not really, uh, it's not really uh, inspirational and looking at gains and so on. Um, the concern I have about natural capital is that, uh, and I've had this discussion with colleagues at the World Bank, it seems that natural capital, if you look at it technically, is not just biodiversity. It's oil and gas under the ground and minerals under the ground and the soil on which you grow agricultural crops and water supplies and things that are linked to biodiversity but that are not biodiversity. So I'm all for better labeling, but I think we can't avoid, uh, you know, we shouldn't lose technical rigor in what we say because if we make a label that doesn't have a solid scientific foundation, that label will get, get away from us. Uh, so I, I encourage everyone to think of a better, more inspirational labels, but I think we have to be scientifically well grounded about it. That's a good point, George. Thank you. Um, I think we do we do move quickly from the flavor of the day, and, and natural capital is one of the flavors of the day, for sure. Uh, can I respond? I don't, I don't I didn't get the question, and I don't think it was a question, but I think. I, let me, because I'm kind of here trying to explain to you on how business thinks and works, and th there is willing business who wants to engage, but I mean, the, the way we talk about these type of things in business is each business has a supply chain, and in the globalized world that we operate in, these supply chains have become very long. You, know, you may talk to British companies, but they, their raw materials come from every corner of the world, and that's where the ecosystem or the biodiversity problems usually occur. And what we need to get to very quickly is a language, and, and wh whether it's more diversified labels or not, that's, I'm, I'll give you that, but that focuses around what are the material issues we're trying to fix. And, and I would suggest we need to go at that from two sides. Every company needs to think through its supply chain and say what are the material impacts I have on ecosystems and biodiversity, and what are the, the fixes or the, the minimization of that impact or the restoration that we should put in place. The conservation world should, should look at it the other way around. What are the biggest ecosystem problems or biodiversity problems that the world has and which are the sectors that are driving those impacts? And then let's, let's put the responsibility discussion on that. But let's and I know it's difficult because there's 150,000 NGOs in this room alone and you all look at your own specific topics, but let's, let's begin to work on where are the hotspots so that we get a movement, an understanding, a language, an action to going. Because we can talk about these things forever, but the problem is, it, I, it was said, I just come out of, out of Asia, we're gonna add two billion more people to the world, we're gonna add uh, a billion people into cities, so we're going to build in the next 25 years, you know, this is, as long as we've been talking about conservation in the next 25 years, we're going to more than double the amount of people in cities. Where's the material going to come from for these cities? You know, we have such an urgency, but we don't have the language yet, so please, let's, let's base it on hotspots. Great, thank you. Pippa. Pippa Howard, uh, Fawn and Four International. <laughs> Uh, my question really is to uh, Peter and I guess to Braulia, but just to thank um, Joe, your statements around the importance of the Habitat Directive and the, the leadership of the IFC and the uh, standards that have been set, the performance standards, which are trying to, to um, sort of, I guess, lay the example of, of what business needs to do. My question really is, the banking sector has got this, you know, a lot, a large proportion of the banking sector and certainly the lenders in, in uh, the, the broader sense, have understood the risks around the uh, loss of biodiversity and ecosystem services. Why is it that business finds it so difficult, given the, you know, the, the geographic spread of the supply chains, why do they find it so difficult to understand that there is loss going on, that this is a risk and it has material consequences on, on, on business? And similarly, on the CBD, the CDB, CBD is looking for trade-offs and is, in a way, sounds to me, trying to find compromises uh, where biodiversity is lost for development. I'm not sure I understand that argument, and I'd like a little bit more clarification. Business needs to understand the urgency. They need to start to take responsibility for their impacts. 
and the no net loss net gain component of what we're trying to talk about over the next few days is really about recognizing that. So I, you know, I don't see why we have to stall. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I don't think I heard myself say that there is any need to stall. If anything, there's a need to accelerate, but it begins with creating a proper understanding, a proper materiality-based analysis. And I don't think that's available in business. And that's not saying that business doesn't care or business, there are no businesses that, that, uh, that take this stuff serious. I mean, there's, like I said, 15 or 20, 20 companies in this room, and they will not be spending their days because they don't know what they want to talk about. But I would, I would actually attack your first point. I do not believe banking gets it. I'm sure there are banking conversations that get it, but the financial system, the capital market valuations are completely independent from ecosystem impacts. Uh, the, 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 the most classic example in the world is CDP. 98% of, uh, of banks, of investors, uh, say they or, or, or actually get and are member of, or whatever the revenue model is of the CDP, one and a half percent uses it in their investment decisions. The information may be there, the use of the information is just not good enough. And m my take on that is, because we're talking in a language that does not resonate what is truly material and how can we scale up the solutions. All right. Next question, yes. Well, yeah, oh, go ahead. I may, okay, yes, yeah. sure. Uh, no, the CBD is not about uh, making trade-offs, even though trade-off is one issue uh, within the broader agenda that uh, we have to face. Uh, what we're aiming at, of course, is uh, a better valuation uh, of biodiversity in all sense, including the economic, but uh, not restricted to the economic values, and a better incorporation of these values into uh, uh, national accounting, public policies, uh, uh, to really uh, um, change the way uh, decision-making is done so that we have a better enabling environment from uh, the government's uh, side in terms of public policies so that we reduce the pressures on, that leads to biodiversity loss because up to now we're still on an uphill battle, right? We're trying to uh, promote conservation where uh, while uh, 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 most of the driving forces are still going the other, uh, uh, the, the other way around. Um, and, and we're also trying to promote better uh, 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 engagement of the, the business sector and their understanding. It's complex, uh, as was said, biodiversity is a complex issue. There's not a, a single easy metrics on it. There's still a lot of uh, uh, unknowns and a lot of uncertainties. Uh, but, of course, that's not a good excuse for not doing better. So uh, what we're aiming at is really trying to get uh, uh, more commitments from governments overall uh, to uh, uh, reduce the pressures on biodiversity and to enhance the cons conservation measures. So uh, within that, certainly there are increasing discussions about what we mean by a sustainable development agenda and in here, of course, there's a need uh, for better uh, appreciation of why biodiversity is important and also uh, uh, more clarity about the, tool, the tools that uh, we can utilize to promote such uh, sustainable development. Just in terms of business uptake, I wanted to comment on the fact that essentially we're in the dark ages in understanding biodiversity. We're transforming it, changing it, but we don't know what impact it's having on the world's species and ecosystems to a large extent. And we have little idea of what then the follow impact is for, for humans and human well-being. And of course, um, we've got our red lists, which provide data information, and those are amazing. We need to continue them. We've got national red lists. Many countries don't even have them in place. And those are essential, a baseline that you need for any sort of planning. But when we talk about biodiversity and we talk about reporting, everyone has a bit of a different idea of what that means. And I think that, that we really have to move towards a currency or an understanding of what biodiversity is and how business can report. 
But the interesting news is that we are on the cusp of a complete data revolution, a technological revolution. We've got satellites going up into space of one meter resolution. In terms of remote sensing, we're going to be able to see ecosystems, how they're changing through time. In terms of remote monitoring units, at ZSL, we're working with Google and a number of other partners to develop remote monitoring units that you can just deploy in any site, a forestry concession, an oil pump concession, and you'd be able to see changes in abundance through time of species. So you don't have to be an expert, but you could easily report in your, in your annual or quarterly reports what's happening to biodiversity in your sites. So if we can do that from space and on the ground, and we have a clear, consistent description of what that is, then I think it's a lot easier for business to report on it. But I think then it's a lot easier to hold business accountable and see that there's transparency. With the satellite technology, we're also going to have the world's public being able to look down and see how the landscapes are being transformed, see if oil palm concessions are where they say they are. And this is a new age of transparency, which will then great, greatly um, change the, um, the accountability. That's a good point, very good point. Yes. Thank you, Michael. I'm Lori Conzo from the International Finance Corporation. Um, just a couple of comments here. One is, I don't know how we can progress this discussion without talking about trade-offs. Um, when it comes to valuation of uh, nature, um, I think we really got to consider, yes, we need to debate, we need to deliberate, but we need to act, and we need to act quickly, because development is acting much quicker than we are in this room. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I appreciate, you know, the precautionary principle, um, we have to remember that there are companies and governments all over the world right now that are developing. Um, Peter, just in the spirit of debate, right? Um, I, I think um, I concur strongly with my colleague in the World Bank's uh, point on natural capital. We need to stay away from lingo. That's what we need to stay away from. Um, natural capital to many people, to many community practices, means land, it means water, and it also means underground resources. It means mineral resources. It means oil and gas reserves. That's what it has meant for the past two decades, actually. Um, and even now, it means land and water to many people and not biodiversity. Um, so I think we need to be very careful about that word. On our experience from the IFC, we deal with businesses day in, day out. Um, my personal experience is that business does get the word biodiversity. It gets the word nature. The problem is it needs to be sector specific. We can't talk business and biodiversity. What you say to forestry is nothing in common. What you're saying to a mining company has nothing in common. What you're saying to hydropower has nothing in common. What you're saying to wind power. It has to be sector specific. So I fully agree on what you're saying about innovation. But innovation cannot happen unless you're talking on the sector specific, people that know industry. So there are many comments made up here today about what business needs to do, what business needs to learn. It's also what everyone in this room needs to learn. We need to learn business. We need to learn how they operate. We need to learn their project timelines. We need to know how they think. And we certainly need to know industry. Without industry, not one of us in this room would, would be able to make you know, an educated contribution in terms of on-site minimization. And that's where it should start. On-site minimization, how do we offset? Um, Last thing I wanted to say is with respect to governments and um, the fact that no one really here has talked about the desire for developing countries to develop, to economically develop. And I know we can disagree philosophically. I, I personally do as well with how things have been developing. But at the same time, the reality of the situation is they want to develop and they want to, they want to use their resources. So we can't come down on them as if you know, we have all the answers. Um, I think we have to engage with them and, and start with the starting point that it's not the businesses a lot of the time, it's the governments that want them there. And if some of those businesses are not developing fast enough, they will get their concessions taken away from them. And that government will give it to some other business that has a lot less standards and will develop it very quickly without any standards. And they'll be happy to do it. So we have to keep that in mind. It's not all business. It's certainly not everyone in this room. It's, it's the governments of these countries and their, their choices that they're making as a sovereign nation. Thank you. I don't know if anybody wants to respond to that. Or they have a panel. 
Good, Julia, you start. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah no, that's a very important point, and it's, it's even more than the elephant in this room. I'll just talk about the World Heritage Convention. IUCN was one of the originators of that, and we're the sort of conscience of the natural and the mixed sites. So let's, let's just give an example, uh, if, if I may. So I, I think many of you know that the Tanzanian government wanted to, and still probably does, sort of, I hope not as much as before, wanted to do a road cutting across the World Heritage Site of the Serengeti National Park. Many of you have been there. And uh, because it wanted to link two towns, which really, one, one, on, the, uh, one on the coast and one on the inland, then the, the, the link would make would help development. It would take a lot less time to get to the coast to take goods out. And of course, the World Heritage and the Biodiversity Committee, the Nature-Based Nature, Nature -based Solutions Committee, which I think we represent here, said, don't, don't do it because you're going to take away the outstanding universal value of the, uh, of the World Heritage Site. I mean, you know, this example could also talk about protected areas, but the World Heritage Sites are the ones that we all know. And, and we are proposing a, another way of linking those two towns. It might take a little bit longer, but basically the World Heritage Site still brings in a lot of economic development to the country in terms of tourism and so on. And, and so there's got to be another, uh, we always have to come up with the trade-off solutions. And that we have to be much more flexible about that, we in the conservation community, than we used to be. When we used to say, no way, no road ever. So we are suggesting something, and the governments are listening, but we need to reach out to them, and we, I totally agree with what Peter Bucker said. We need to speak in simple language that's, you know, I don't think everybody out there understands what biodiversity is. IUCN itself has now taken the big step after 67 years of existence to talk about nature and the solutions that nature offers. Yes, uh, uh, certainly, uh, uh, we need to take into account the uh, sectoral aspects, and there are some specificities there. But one of the things we're discussing, for example, uh, in New York on uh, sustainable development uh, goals, is that we need to make, take a more integrated approach. And I uh, subscribe very much to what our colleague from TNC mentioned about the need to have a, a landscape approach. Mm -hmm. So if you just take a, a sectoral approach, you miss opportunities of, of looking at the added impact of different sectors acting in the same uh, landscape and potential options for gain if we can bring the sectors to work together and deliver uh, on common uh, goals for uh, uh, making a better access, uh, ensuring better access to water or to fertile soil or to conserve biodiversity or to produce more food. Uh, and I guess we need to uh, uh, link some of these agendas. So for example, how do we face some of these conflicts of interest uh, uh, b because of the growing population and the drive for development in, 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 in developing countries? And of course, we cannot blame developing countries for wanting to uh, uh, promote more development and increase the, the livelihood of uh, their population. Uh, one of these uh, agendas I would like to recommend to all of you to consider is the issue of uh, degraded lands. Mm. There are too much, too many degraded lands out there in the world. People estimate between one billion to two billion uh, 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 hectares. There's no excuse to have degraded ecosystems out there. We should be making better use of these, either for uh, 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 restoring them for food production or for energy production or whatever, or to restore conservation of biodiversity and ecosystem service. So maybe by looking and bridging some of these different uh, agenda out there is, and not keeping just to mm -hmm. uh, discuss things in a fragmented way, I think we might uh, find a way out. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Joe, you wanted to yeah. make a comment um, on this also? Also agree, Lori, with your comment about the the right for for countries to develop their resources, improve their economic situation. I think the fundamental problem is that the decisions and discussions about how to develop are happening in one room, and the, the, and the consideration of biodiversity is happening in another. Yeah, and you know, bringing those together under one unified framework, at a at a scale that's appropriate, I think, is the way to to, to solve a lot of those issues. Um, cut, they can develop those resources in a way that maintains the biodiversity values and the ecosystem service they deliver. That's not going to happen unless you're doing it as, in, in a in a unified unified fashion. Um, I, 
to, to me, I think the two things have to happen for mitigation if it's going to change. It's going to be an effective tool. We have to go big and we have to go early. So we have to go big, meaning we have to bring it to a scale where you can start to look at trade-offs for different development scenarios and what the consequences those are for biodiversity, for ecosystem services. Um, and we have to do it early. So we can't wait until someone's proposing a, a, a development, already made significant investments, and then start thinking about how we're going to use mitigation hierarchy as a way to get the best outcome. That's, that's broken. It's not going to work. We have the science. We have the tools to be able to do that. Um, there's, there, there's no reason we shouldn't be doing it. Um, one last comment I want to make, and I, I agree with the gentleman's comment about uh, the focus on what I think are the functional aspects of biodiversity. Uh, and that's natural capital. I, uh, you know, I'm not a marketing person, so I'm going to let some marketing genius figure out a way that we can communicate biodiversity. But, but the reality is biodiversity is complicated. Uh, you know, there, there's genetic biodiversity, species biodiversity, and ecosystem <coughs> components of biodiversity. And there's really no way around that. Again, let the marketing geniuses figure out how to simplify mm -hmm. that. But if we focus just on those functional aspects of biodiversity, we know from the literature that we can lose species diversity and still maintain functional values of ecosystems. So if, we, if we're not careful about how we use the term biodiversity offsets or no net loss of biodiversity, it's going to be very easy for critics to come in and say, you're not achieving no net loss of biodiversity unless we define what it is that we're focused on. If it's going to be functional aspects, I, we have to then embrace the idea that there's the potential that we can lose species diversity, certainly genetic diversity. It's going to be ecological systems. It's going to be impossible to, main, to, to hit a no net loss target. Yeah. No one tells engineers they should simplify their language. That's right, so we can understand it. There are a couple more questions that I want to get to from the audience here. George has got the microphone. Uh, in George now. Kelly, Environmental Bank and Exchange. Two quick questions. Um, one of which is uh, that we've heard from IUCN, CBD, WCSD, Bebop. It sounds like a rap song, but I, um, <laughs> what, what I see in this world, in, in the environmental world, is that we have a lot of disparate voices all doing the same thing. Um, we have targets that are all, I heard three different types of targets today. Um, and then we have targets that are never held, nobody is ever held accountable for. <laughs> And so my question is, is there an opportunity for harmonization? And is there an opportunity for accountability? Because we in the U.S. have lived with all these, these kind of targets that are never met. Um, and it seems like they, uh, they're actually doing worse because we set a target and we hold no one accountable. That's question one. Question two is really kind of oriented to Joe and this question, uh, the big question of, we know we don't really have enough science to be perfect in this dynamic. But the question you have is, should we do nothing or should we start movement? And is offsets, is it better to do offsets now without perfection or not? Because what we, I would argue in the US, we started in an imperfect dynamic, but what we did is advance the science and identified gaps. And now this concept of landscape scales being driven by the fact that we've had an offset uh, regime in place. So thank you for those. Right here, in the middle. There, there was a good question. <laughs> yeah. The answers are, anybody want to try to well, answer? Do you want us to wait Jeff. a little bit? Or yeah. Take well, let's more, take a couple yeah. of questions yeah, first. We'll take three questions mm -hmm. right here in the middle. If you could pass the microphone down. OK, my name is Friedrich Wolf. I'm from Friends of the Earth Europe. And uh, I'm referring to a statement made by Peter Bakker, but I uh, would also appreciate some uh, and, uh, others from uh, answers from uh, CBD and IUCN, so if you want to comment on that, I'd be pleased as well. Um, I was pleased to hear that business as usual is not an option for business, which is uh, great, but uh, uh, then I learned um, that you were referring to a new climate economy, or which is to me related to something, a green economy, so a, an economy that goes with nature, um, that optimizes the process. But uh, uh, I was wondering, and, and, and that, of course, uh, legitimates also to go ahead with growth. And I was wondering um, whether you were also considering that there might be, in the face of, as you said, 9 billion people in 2050 on the planet, in the face of finite resources, um, and in the face also of finite global biodiversity, um, thinking about a limit to growth altogether, um, I'm just referring also to 
um, the global footprint and uh, instrument developed uh, by WWF and others, um, which is in this and uh, other European countries more than twice as high as uh, the, the natural resources we have at our disposition. So I, I was wondering uh, where your thinking is, are there any limits to uh, growth altogether and are there limits also to offsetting on a global scale? Thank you. Great. And then we'll take a third question right here. My name is Rijn Willems. I'm chairman of the Dutch platform uh, Biodiversity Ecosystems and Economy. And by the way, on the fourth last, last page, you see some uh, af advertisement of this organization. <laughs> it's a very pragmatic approach between the Dutch Employers Federation and IUCN, uh, with companies working together on, on how do you really start defining things and incorporating the principles of no, uh, uh, retaining natural capital in your, in your operations. And Peter will be pleased to note that we don't speak about net, no net loss anymore, mm -hmm. sort of triple negative, which doesn't sound very good, but maintaining mm -hmm. natural capital. The real challenge is that, and I think Laurie talked about that as well, we're talking about companies in very, very different sectors where the rules and standards that you apply in one sector will be completely different from, other, uh, from the other. And the real challenge at this stage is how we get the five or six companies that are really interested in Holland at the moment, multiple to 250 companies, to 100 companies. That's a challenge we're trying to set ourselves at this stage with the help of the NGOs who have, in very specific areas, very specific answers. My, my question to government is, uh, governments at this stage, I believe, cannot s set overall strict standards yet. I think the, the basic rule that governments can do is challenging companies to start working on how do they maintain the, the, in their value chain the natural capital in the globe. Uh, and they can start doing that, similar as they have done in other areas uh, of, 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 uh, areas of diversity and safety management. How do you start reporting on this issue before you set legislation? My question to the audience here is, the, the, the people on the other side of the table here is, do you really believe that government has a leading role or is it still in the end, and it's my personal view, that business has the leading role to get convinced it's important? Great, great. So we'll, we'll st start with those two questions. The first was come from George, and the idea was harmonization, yeah. I think, was one of your questions. Julia, Let, let me try to, to take a, a, a stab at that. But also, I want to say that IUCN really enjoys working with Ryan and, and, and the, the whole, that whole business uh, coalition. And, and I, th I think on the harmonization, I think we really have a problem that we've all grown up in our silos, and we're continuing to to live in those silos. I mean, some of, I don't know how many of you were at the Rio Plus 20 conference, but it really showed the, the problem with that. Governments were in one room, business in the other, scientists in the other, faith-based communities in the other, and IUCN gets to walk around between them, but we need to get our act together. On harmonization, however, I think we're all, we all realize this is a problem. The entire four-year IUCN program adopted by all our members in Jeju two years ago is focused on making sure that the IG targets at 192 governments agreed, I think, at 3.30 in the morning, which is the way it always seems to happen, uh, that the, the IG targets are also our targets, our members' targets. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. And, uh, but this, we need to insist on this all the time. In discussing the Sustainable Development Goals, also late at night in New York, those targets were not mentioned because it wasn't the same ministers who were in, in Nagoya who were discussing those. But we, we need to make sure that these messages get in. On just one more harmonization example on land degradation, we, we think there are two billion hectares, Braulio, that could, could be restored. And so we've joined with uh, governments and, and others to launch in 2011 a so-called bond challenge where we really have a target by 2020 to restore 150 million of those hectares of degraded land. And we're getting there slowly. And by the way, the way to do that is through a landscape approach, which, which is what many of us said. So those are just two examples. Thank you. So we'll then go to the question from Friends of the Earth and the idea of uh, a limit to growth. And I think mm -hmm. that would be uh, George, maybe, or Peter, maybe you yeah. could speak to that one. Yeah, so um, I, I think there's absolutely, I mean, it's ridiculous to think there are no limits to growth. Uh, like you say, there are, there are a finite amount of resources on the planet. Um, so somewhere, somehow there will be. The reality in the world is that our economic system does not have many theories for declining economies. All our economic theories are based on growth. and. This is something we urgently need to develop. The issue we have now, 
and I refer to the new climate economy, is um, we need to get the world mobilized to move on climate extremely quickly. I mean, the, the urgency there is massive. To your point on discussions in New York, it may well be possible that climate doesn't make it as an SDG. Well, I will lose faith in the SDGs if that was the final decision, but that's probably my lack of understanding. So yes, there are limits, but at the moment, I think the big challenge for all of us is to make sure that action gets put in place. The, 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 back, the debate around action is, if climate action causes the economy not to grow, we will not implement uh, that action, and then we're going to shoot ourselves in the foot, and that's going to be the value of that report. But that doesn't say that somewhere there will be limits to growth. I'm not going to prolong the debate whether natural capital or biodiversity, because I would not know what I'm talking about if I had to go one more round. <laughs> but let me give you what I think are my five elements on how we can achieve scale, and, and this is in the conversation with business. If you want to attract an individual company to play, you need to talk to him, to, to, to that company, in a language that mobilizes and inspires the CEO. That's the reality. If you do not get the top of the company interested, you're not going to move the company. And biodiversity and no net loss is a language that I know no CEO who will be moving. And that, that may be the limitation of all the CEOs and all true, but that's reality. Second thing is sector. You're totally right there. Set standards in the sector and let's continue to drive them up as fast as we can. And then a whole industry will move. The third one, not to be forgotten, is the supply chain. Why is uh, zero net deforestation the first global uh, effort that seems to get real traction? Is because the consumer brands are pushing all the way down into the into the Indonesian forests, their demands for no deforestation. Supply chains and brands, so consumer brands, are going to be an incredibly important friend of all of yours to achieve the, the causes we're after here. The fourth one is think new. We must all think circular economy, because the less we need to dig out of the ground, the less the impact on, on Mother Nature. So circular economy ought to be linked to these type of ecosystem and biodiversity debates to prevent more damage than is required. And the fifth one, that's five, number five in scaling up, drive it into the accounting rules. Do not depend on companies or sectors who are willing to engage with you. Make it mandatory for all business to play according to these rules. And then you get the skill we need. Great, thank you. And then the last question that was posed was um, this idea of you know, who, who leads in the dance? Is it governments that can lead? Is it businesses that can lead? Is it NGOs that can lead? And why don't we start down at that end, Glenn, and then Joe. Thank you. Um, as an organization that's spent a lot of time engaging with business, um, what is clear, and as Joe said earlier, is that the regulatory framework is what business asks for. So you have assurance of what your investments will deliver over time. The flip of that is that um, governments move rather slowly, and so you need the innovation and the excitement of business in there. Um, we are committed through our corporate stewardship program to find businesses that are leading, A, in their sector, but also that they make requests to government, because us speaking to government is less effective as an NGO than business speaking to government. So it's circular and the different roles need to be there. And I don't think there's any point in saying one leads to the other. Um, there are some great landmark thresholds, uh, Habitats Directive being one which has informed and driven business activity and we shouldn't step away from that. I think the UK government has been tremendous in DEFRA's natural capital assessment of the whole of the UK and getting within Treasury a natural capital committee which we hope is effective and has a strong voice. Uh, and if that model was played out in other countries where you have, uh, you know, in, in the central decision-making uh, forum for economic development, uh, natural capital voice or whatever title, a voice for nature, uh, that, that's an important way forward. But it's combining the two, I think. Thanks. Joe. Yeah, so I'm very interested in this because I work with both governments and businesses. Um, one thing that almost always surprises me is the extent to which businesses tend not to often even have awareness of the natural resources or natural 
capital that they rely on and that actually represent a material risk to their businesses. And it isn't even normal practice to, to look at ecosystem services like water supply strategically through the planned lifetime of a, a business operation to even check whether it's going to be a sustainable supply. So I don't think it's about language. I think it's about changing practice because we already know that these risks are there. It's just that for some reason they're ignored. Working with governments, there's a massive capacity issue. It's, it's the same even in this country. Uh, the majority of local planning authorities in this country don't have a qualified <coughs> ecologist on their staff who can actually review applications to see if they're acceptable from a, an ecological point of view. And if you go to Liberia or somewhere, um, expecting people in those countries to review complex environmental statements and offset proposals and mitigation strategies when they have one untrained person in the office and someone, you know, and the turnover of staff is so high. But somehow improving capacity in environmental assessment is not sexy enough a subject to ever get funding from anyone. Mm -hmm. So IAIA has tried, the International Association for Impact Assessment tried for a whole decade to get small amounts of funds to send government representatives and ecologists to meetings to learn about impact assessment and pretty much failed comprehensively to get any money from anyone apart from a brief period when about 10 people came. So it's about putting money where the mouth is, and if, if the game's got to change, then invest in the nuts and bolts of assurance and standards and implementing them and monitoring them, and do it. And in Europe, we've known for 20 years that if you don't monitor mitigation outcomes, nobody's going to bother. You only have to recommend what you're going to do. Nobody's going to check whether you ever did it or not. But the directive's just been revised, and there's no wording in there strongly on mitigation follow-up and actually assuring that people do what they've committed to do. So. You have the last word here. <laughs> Thanks. No, some good uh, questions. Um, I think we th there are opportunities for increased harmonization and accountability. I think we're seeing a, a good mo movement in terms of uh, uh, convergence, uh, certainly within the uh, conservation movement, um, and I think we're seeing a lot of uh, 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 progress in uh, dialogues with, between conservation and development. Uh, accountability, certainly. I think uh, uh, establishing um, agreed uh, targets is one uh, good instrument, but I if you don't monitor, as uh, was said, then it can be useless. So we need good monitoring of targets. We need good empowerment of everyone in society to make use of this, of the information on monitoring to uh, 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 pressure governments and, and companies to really uh, deliver on, on, on promises. Uh, f uh, finite uh, resources, yes, that's a big problem. Uh, I would uh, recommend you to read uh, an uh, interesting book called The Mortal Sea, not because people can die in the sea, but because the sea can die, mm -hmm. uh, written by a, a histori American historian uh, called Bolster from the University of New Hampshire. And he tells the whole history of fisheries uh, mishaps in the Northwest, uh, Northwest Atlantic for more than... Uh, 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 500, uh, 500 years. And an interesting thing is that it has been a succession of collapse of fisheries, one after the other since the 17th century. And the collapse of cod some 10, uh, little, uh, more than 20 years ago was just the last of these uh, collapse. And the response from governments and from business has always been the same. Let's uh, increase, let's use new technology to increase our fishing capability. So that only uh, 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 produced a worse result in the end because we're just uh, 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 destroying even more the fishery stock. And that's the, the common re response that we, see, uh, we still see. And that's just one example in one of the sectors. Uh, scaling up, yes, we, we badly need uh, 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 good ideas for scaling up. We have very good local uh, uh, initiatives everywhere. But uh, uh, it's a challenge to scale up. We need funding. We need to bring sectors together. 
In the climate change, we have some uh, mechanisms like the clean development mechanism, the Red Plus, and I think we need to uh, uh, pay more attention to this kind of mechanism in the biodiversity sector uh, uh, as well. And uh, uh, as was said, I think we need uh, leadership from both governments and, and business. In the CBD, what I see very often is governments, uh, many governments reluctant to be more uh, forceful in their decision making because they are afraid of uh, 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 hitting their industry, the interests of their, uh, uh, the, their business sector. So we need leadership from the business sector to come back and tell the governments, this is what we need. Uh, we don't uh, want to keep just business as usual because we will lose competitiveness and we will get out of business. Thank you. And we need all these things quickly. I mean, this is what I lose sleep on is pace. We are all, all of us in all of our institutional settings move much, much too slowly to address these issues we're talking about. And so I think that's a challenge to each of us. And hopefully to the, over the next two days, we can, we can pick up the pace as a group and we can start to come up with some solutions with a group like this that we can start to really act on. So with that, I think we now can go have a little bit of coffee to get ready for picking up the pace again. Um, we'll come back in at 11.25, please. And when we come back, our moderator will be Tony Juniper.